the bell. Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. And right now, we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romain Bostic alongside Scarlett Fu. We're counting you down to the closing bell and here to help take us beyond the bell. Carol Masser and Matt Miller with our global simulcast. Welcome to our audiences across Bloomberg Television, radio, as well as Bloomberg Originals. Uh, Carol, I mean, look, we talk about the catalyst being that CPI report mm -hmm. uh, this morning, but really, I think a lot of people are looking much further past that, and they're seeing a green light. Maybe they're right. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I think it's kind of interesting the the reset that we got certainly on uh, the Treasury trade today. And uh, even though Fed speakers keep reminding us that there's still higher rates to come, but maybe we are beginning to see uh, the light at the end of the tunnel in terms of the Fed and this rate hiking cycle. But remember, everybody, it's going to stay high for a while. And well, I would also say if you're buying right now, I hope you're hedging because on Friday <laughs> we have a deluge of earnings that could disappoint. I mean, I'm sure you guys all saw the Goldman Sachs story that that Shri wrote um, they're out to everybody on the street basically warning I don't know if I'm allowed to say the they word basically pre-announced exactly that uh, earnings are not going to be good so please lower your forecast so we can try and beat them um, that's a problem if it's a problem at Goldman Sachs I can imagine it being a problem across the street and uh, I would be worried uh, about earnings it's next. a negative story but it's not a problem for the stock today it's up 1.6 percent gaining for a, four, a fourth straight day so they're probably thrilled that they uh, leaked this or warned uh, on earnings on a day in which the markets were looked past it because of inflation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, potential reality check, of course, starting tomorrow. We get names like Progressive, names like PepsiCo, as well as names like Delta Airlines, and then, of course, the big banks on Thursday, on Friday. But look, let's just have the equity market have its moment in the sun here on this Wednesday afternoon as we get the closing bells. The Dow Jones Industrial Average higher by about 85 points on the day, up about three-tenths of a percent. That actually is your relative laggard on the day. The S&P 500 up by about eight-tenths of a percent. The Nasdaq Composite up by more than one percent. And the Russell 2000 going to log a gain here on the day of about 20 points. Good for a 1% gain. Yeah, looking at breath in the market, too, and we're going to get into the individual names and also the uh, major industry groups. But if I look at the S&P 500, 325 names, Matt, to the upside, 176 to the downside, two unchanged. NASDAQ 100, 76 higher, 25 lower. So it's been a good day uh, for the S&P 500. In fact, we gained more today than we did yesterday, but we didn't have the same kind of breadth in terms of the industry groups. If you take a look at the GRR, the group rank returns, you can see that communication services, utilities, and materials led the way today, but healthcare and industrials were down. And remember yesterday, we had only gainers in terms of the industry groups. All right, guys, let's talk to some of the uh, individual gainers in today's session. Let's talk a little bit of pizza, Domino's, up uh, as much as 17% in today's session finishing with about an 11% gain, uh, topping the S&P 500, uh, entering an agreement that allows U.S. customers to order Domino's products through the Uber Eats marketplace. Delivery is going to be handled by Domino's. But basically, this deal has the potential to bring Uber Eats orders to 70% of Domino's stores around the world. So you can understand why that's a kick to the upside. Uh, Recursion Pharmaceuticals, not a name we talk about a lot, but man, up 78%. It's a $2.3 billion market cap biotech surging. Uh, after reporting a $50 million investment by NVIDIA, which was executed as a private investment in public equity. Uh, it's about accelerating development of its AI foundation models for bio and chemistry, intends to collaborate with NVIDIA. So, yeah. A bit of an AI play there as well. SunPower Corporation also a standout, up more than 8% in today's session. Heavy volume. Raymond James coming out, upgrading this name to strong buy from Outperform following its stock slump uh, in 2023. Target, though, keeping at 21 a share, and you can see closing at 10 and change. And then I do want to mention Chinese ADRs, really an outperformer in today's session. The Chinese premier, Li Kuang, meeting with senior execs at uh, Chinese tech companies, including Alibaba and some others, vowing more support. Pinduo do. PDD, it was the number one gainer in the NASDAQ 100, and it was up, uh, Scarlett, about 6% today. All right, let's take a look at the decliners. I'm going to start with the worst performer in the S&P 500, and that's Palo Alto Networks, falling the most since November, down 7% as cybersecurity names as a whole, especially the market leaders here, Palo Alto Networks and Zscaler, uh, fell after Microsoft announced a push into that sector. Lucid Group, and Carol, I know you've highlighted this several times mm -hmm. because it's done so well. It plunged as much as 13% after the EV startup delivered fewer cars than estimated in the second quarter, only 1,404 vehicles. And Elevance, which used to be uh, Anthem, is now down uh, about 5%, actually 
health insurers as a group declining in response to analyst downgrades before they report earnings. Uh, Wolf cut its outperform ratings for Elevance and Centene. Investors are really questioning whether these insurers are sufficiently prepared for an unexpected increase in medical care usage. And United Health, by the way, will be reporting uh, the first of the bunch report before the open on Friday. And finally, Cisco down more than 2%. Bank of America downgrading it to neutral, saying the average analyst estimates look too high, and the consensus assumes a sharp order recovery, uh, which it doesn't see in the offing. All right, let's take a look at the cross-asset space. The dollar actually having its worst day going back to early January, but a lot of action in the Treasury space on the back of that CPI report. Remember, guys, what was it? I think just a week ago, last Thursday, when we got mm -hmm. that ADP report, <laughs> you had that two-year yield surge like 17 basis points, mm -hmm. above 5%, something like 5.1, at least here on today. We're down about 13% to close out the day, back around 4.7% on the two-year. Similar moves on the 10-year yield, which, again, everybody was tearing their hair out a week ago after a climb back above 4%, now down 11% on the day to about 3.8. Your 30-year yield now at 3.9. And this is proof, Romain, of, uh, of what you were saying earlier, that the market is looking straight through the July decision yeah. um, to the next one, which I believe is in September, right? Because... Yeah. Um, Obviously, you don't want to be buying at the front of the curve if you think the Fed is going to raise rates, but they are doing that right now uh, because they're already discounting, um, I think, uh, a, a no move in the in the following meet, meeting. So I another think, another pause. I think it'll be interesting. I was I was joking with Scar a little bit earlier about how I was kind of sick of the Fed, but I think the market, I mean, when you talk to, honestly, when you talk to investors, they're saying that this is now the market that can kind of move past the Fed to a certain extent, that they could focus a little bit more on corporate fundamentals, focus on economic conditions, divorced from all the sort of uh, Fed speak that we've been obsessing over for the last year and a half. You know, you guys had an interesting interview uh, with Ron Temple over at Lazard earlier, and I, I love this quote that's been put into one of our stories. It's not, it's too early to pop the champagne, but it's not too early to start chilling the bottle, like coming oh. off the CPI. So it's like... Carol uh, loves a good wine reference, don't you? <laughs> I do like a good line reference. Uh, but I get what you're saying, that maybe, again, we're getting some clarity about the end of this Fed interest rate hiking cycle. So maybe we understand that and we can start thinking about fundamentals well, and but what it, could, else? it could move in the other direction just as easily. I forget who said it, but someone once compared treasuries to meme stocks because they mm. swing so much, especially on the short end. And we've seen these massive moves. Don't you agree, Romain? I mean, it's not normal to see 15, uh, 16 basis point yeah. moves in a day. Yeah, it's tamped down a little bit. But uh, yeah, we went through that period where it was just absolutely mind boggling. I, I am curious, though, about the optimism that somehow the Fed is done or at least close to being done. And I don't know if the folks you've talked to, Matt, uh, on, on radio today and on your television program had that same sentiment. But a lot a lot of people we've talked to today here, they've been pretty optimistic, saying that, look, this is real. This this downtrend in inflation and that this is basically now that uh, basically all the Fed needs to basically say we're done. Yeah. I, I mean, everyone that I've spoken to today has said um, he or she thinks we are done with the exception of Tony Roth. We just talked to the chief investment officer at Wilmington Trust, and he said um, it's a toss up between the Fed's going to raise one more time and be done or raise three more times, which I thought was interesting. Oh. Um, I'm looking at the range. Uh, a real pessimism when it comes to the economy, right? Uh, if, if you plug the rate r rises that we've already seen into the Fed's um, FURBUS model, then you can see uh, the oh. vi lagged and variable effects taking out two to two and a half percent of growth in the following quarters in in 2024. And if you look at ECFC on the Bloomberg terminal, mm -hmm. you can see that we're now expecting job losses in Q4 and in Q1 of next year. So um, it seems like the economy could take a hit. Does that show up, though, as good news in the stock market once those companies announce those moves to consolidate and to reduce expenses? Uh, well, you yeah, know, the stock question. market reacts uh, in, in some ways that are unpredictable, but sometimes uh, bad news is good news, if yeah. that's what you're saying. Guys, I'm going to send you a tab of about $1,600 for this pointless meeting. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Did you see that Shopify story? Yeah. They're going to shame workers? We, we, we saw it, and, and I thought we had forwarded it to you, Carol. Because, oh, did uh, you? Oh. Yeah, well, Carol never shows up to meetings anyway. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, no, I mean, it was... It, I look. Believe. Do you? I, 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 yeah. didn't, didn't you guys get I forwarded it to Carol. Will Shaker sent it to me. Carol. We've been passing it around the newsroom <laughs> so, because so, we all so, have right. pointless so, so how much time have you wasted money? passing around the story about wasting time on meetings? <laughs> the numbers just keep ticking higher right now above exactly. our heads. Exactly. It's now 3,200. By the way, I just want to say this simulcast, priceless. There you go. Yes. We'll leave it on that note. I agree with you. I think that's where we're going to end. All right, guys, that's a wrap. Our cross-platform coverage, radio, TV, YouTube, and Bloomberg Originals. We will see you again tomorrow.